Hello, my name is Stuart Rosen. I'm a consultant cardiologist at London North West University Healthcare NHS Trust and I'm Professor of Practice Cardiology National Heart and Lung Institute Imperial College. I'm going to speak to you today briefly about inotropes, why we use them, which ones to use, when to use them and for whom. Now the first little bit of background information you need is to think about how the circulation operates overall and in particular to appreciate that we need enough cardiac output to fit the demands of any given situation. Cardiac output itself is the product of stroke volume, how full the heart is per beat, multiplied by heart rate. There are a number of factors influencing stroke volume. These include the preload, the extent of filling of the heart before the beat, afterload, the resistance against which it contracts, and contractility, the overall pumping power of the heart. You'll see on the slide these various factors influencing preload. They include um, the background pressure in the venous side of the circulation, which in turn reflects the compliance of the veins and the um, pressure within the chest, atrial contractility, heart rate, aortic pressure, and overall compliance of the ventricle. Those are the determinants of preload. Within the physiological range of activity, any increase in end diastolic volume will bring about an increase in stroke volume for a constant heart rate. You will see on the next slide the very well known Frank Starling law which relates the stroke volume to left ventricular end diastolic pressure or volume. In essence the heart empties everything that is put into it in circumstances of health. Afterload, in simple terms, is the resistance offered by the systemic circulation to cardiac output. Again, this will vary according to circumstances of pressure within the ventricular chambers and with the systemic pressure. A number of factors influence contractility, the heart's ability to pump in an appropriately powerful way. These include calcium release within the cells, which in turn is related to stimulation of beta adrenoreceptors. Influencing those will be circulating catecholamines, overall sympathetic nervous system activation, the extent of inhibition of vagal activity, and additionally, uh, an unusual effect named the Bowditch effect, which is a function of heart rate. The next slide shows you that as heart rate increases, there will be a temporary increase in tension between myocardial fibres simply as a function of rate, and this returns to normal within a few beats of cessation of that, beast, of that period of tachycardia. Beta adrenoreceptors are key to the mediation of the influence of um, circulating catecholamines, as you'll see from the accompanying slide, through three main effects, one being an increase in heart rate, positive chronotropy, one an increase in the force of contraction, positive inotropy, and at the same time included into this mix is that of peripheral tone within the arteries. A number of the drugs which we will go on to look at in detail act on different parts of this with different degrees of intensity. When do we need to apply these drugs? The first question is, are we able to achieve adequate cardiac output for, for the given set of circumstances? Where the heart itself is not able to pump powerfully enough for the needs of peripheral tissues and for the needs of organs, you have a situation termed cardiogenic shock. In those circumstances, the contractility of the heart is probably the first priority in terms of increasing output. There will also be circumstances where the central problem is that of redistribution, what might be termed redistributive shock. In sepsis, circumstances of advanced infection, 
There is a good circulating volume and plenty of cardiac output, but the dilatation of the peripheral vessels means that this fluid has been distributed through a larger volume. This is particularly intense and acute in circumstances of anaphylaxis. Less commonly, there are neurogenic conditions that can bring this about. There can finally be a need to increase blood pressure or peripheral perfusion when administered fluids have not achieved the desired effect. So inotropic drugs are needed when you need to increase contractility and pressor drugs are the drugs of choice when vascular smooth muscle constriction is the missing factor to maintaining perfusion. Finally, vasodilator drugs will allow a reduction in vascular resistance be it venous or arterial, to allow the heart to function more effectively. We will now go through a series of specific inotropic drugs, considering their individual effects. If we go through the list of commonly used inotropic agents, dopamine is of particular value in circumstances of cardiogenic shock, in heart failure, also in symptomatic bradycardia that has been unresponsive to atropine. Dopamine given typically between 2 and 20 micrograms per kilogram per minute, usually at the lower end, acts upon dopaminergic re receptors. It acts to a significant extent on beta-1 receptors and it also will act on alpha-1 receptors. The major side effects of its use include severe hypertension, particularly in patients who are already taking non-selective beta blockers. There's a risk of ventricular arrhythmia, cardiac ischemia and tissue ischemia. Perhaps the most commonly used agent, which can also be administered peripherally, is that of dobutamine. It is of particular appeal in circumstances of low cardiac output, for example decompensated heart failure, cardiogenic shock, sepsis-induced myocardial dysfunction, and again, if necessary, symptomatic bradycardia, and is administered in doses varying from 2 to 20 micrograms per kilogram per minute, intravenously up to a maximum of 40. The principal receptor upon which this drug is effective is the beta-1 receptor. It is also, to a lesser extent, effective on peripheral alpha receptors, the obvious side effect is that of tachycardia and increased ventricular response rates in patients with atrial fibrillation. Ventricular arrhythmias are relatively common at higher doses and the increased cardiac work will exacerbate cardiac ischemia through increased oxygen demand. The next drug commonly used is that of noradrenaline, also known as norepinephrine particularly of value in redistributive shock to tighten up the periphery. It's particularly effective on alpha receptors and to a slightly less extent beta-1 receptors. Side effects again include arrhythmia and bradycardia and peripheral ischemia in conditions where blood flow in limbs is critically compromised. Adrenaline itself, which was the first agent to be used in this context, remains of value in cardiogenic shock, uh, cardiac arrest, and as well as its well-known value in bronchospasm and anaphylaxis. It can also be of value in symptomatic bradycardia. Its mode of action is through the alpha receptor, alpha-1 receptor, the beta-1, and also on beta-2 receptors. Side effects include ventricular arrhythmias and severe hypertension, which in an unchecked case can result in uh, cerebrovascular hemorrhage. Much less commonly used today, but still of some value, is the fairly pure chronotrope, isoprenaline, also known as isoproterenol. And phenylephrine is used in circumstances of hypotension um, particularly for vaguely mediated or medication induced uh, falls in blood pressure. It would increase mean arterial pressure um, and similar effects are achieved through use of metaraminol. 
One side effect to be aware of with this particular pair of drugs is that of reflex bradycardia and hypertension as well as severe peripheral and visceral vasoconstriction. In intensive care use, the phosphodiesterase inhibitors milrinone and amrinone are well known and um, of value in circumstances of low cardiac output but with some continuing peripheral vasodilator action. Side effects again include ventricular arrhythmias and uh, un in unusual circumstances um, cardiac ischemia. An interesting possibility that was raised a few years ago is whether the blood pressure raising effect, the, vasopress the, the, the vasopressive effect, could be achieved using vasopressin acting through V1 receptors in vascular smooth muscle or in V2 receptors which, act, which are found in the renal collecting duct system. The effect would be of particular value in conditions of shock, particularly vasodilator or cardiogenic shock. The drug has been trialled in cardiac arrest and has been shown to be of significant value in the management of patients undergoing cardiac surgery. Obvious side effects include those of arrhythmias and hypertension and at times decreased cardiac output. The argument for its use is that the desired effects can often be achieved with less of an increase in myocardial oxygen demand than through traditional sympathomimetic agents. A final drug worth considerable thought and consideration is that of levosimendam of tremendous potential value in the management of decompensated heart failure. This drug, a, cal a calcium sensitizer, effectively improves the quality of contraction within the myocardium and thereby enhances cardiac output. Side effects potentially would include tachycardia, enhanced AV conduction and hypotension. A number of slides have been added to this presentation that will demonstrate the effect at the cellular level of sympathomimetic anotropic agents and phosphodiesterase inhibitors. These show the relationship between the stimulation of the adrenoreceptor, the cyclic AMP second messenger system within the cell, the, the activity of circa and the mobilization of calcium within cells, and the effect of these movements on mitochondrial function within the cardiomyocyte. The signal transduction pathways are included among these slides, as well as the interplay between excitation, contraction, coupling and mitochondrial energetics. Within this context you will also find slides that show the action of the oldest of positive inotropic agents, namely cardiac glycosides, characterized particularly by digoxin. The role of action, the mode of action of levosimendan, the most modern expression of this mechanism, and a number of slides which point to the future through a novel agent, Omecamtiv mecabril which is being investigated currently in relation to amplifying the mechanochemical cyclic properties of myosin. I hope you have found this talk of value and please look through the slides to obtain your take home messages of the value of inotropes in the range of clinical conditions which you will meet. Thank you.